Chapter 25 and 26. Abandonment hits me harder than any slap of weather. I didn't want to admit it, but I was counting on Sean and Denver to keep me safe. For their knowledge and food and gear and companionship to protect me, at least for a little bit. Now both of them have disappeared. The wind and hail are relentless. All the energy drains out of me. Once again, I am alone in a storm. Grief comes hard and fast as a bullet. I sit down on a rock and put my head in my hands. I miss my best friend. I'm sorry, Lucas, I whisper. I can't do this. Not without help. Not without you. I think about what had happened after the blueberry picking disaster. We had patched things up and kept going with the list, but something felt broken between us. We had built a raft and floated down the Connecticut River, only to have it tumble apart as we were trying to land it. The night on Chimney Hill hadn't been spooky at all, but I forgot to zip up the tent door and we ended up covered in hundreds of tick and mosquito bites. But it was when we were popping wheelies in the school parking lot that it really all fell apart. Lucas had mastered the one-wheeled trick almost immediately, but hours passed and all I had to show for it were dozens of scrapes and bruises on my elbows and knees. Maybe we should try again tomorrow, Lucas had said. I hopped on my bike for one last go. I pedaled as hard as I could, then jerked my handlebars up. The bike flew over my head and I went sprawling, cracking the back of my helmet against the pavement. Lucas rushed over and bent down to pull me up. Don't help me, I snapped. I'm tired of you protecting me. You never let me get up by myself or stand on my own two feet. Lucas drew back as if I had punched him in the face. Toe, that's not true. Sure it is. I struggled to my feet. Blood ran down my calf. Why do you even hang out with me? I've been nothing but bad luck since the day you met me. Lucas shook his head. I hang out with you because we have fun together. So what if bad stuff happens to us sometimes? Or maybe you like being the hero. I could feel my tailbone throbbing. Maybe you need me to mess up so you can fix everything. Maybe that's why you keep me around, so you can feel good about yourself. Lucas's shoulders straightened. He walked past me and picked up his bike. You know what? Maybe you are bad luck. Maybe it's time I started making new friends. And then Lucas had ridden away from me. He had not looked back. A chunk of hail smashes into my shoulder and brings me back to the rock where I'm sitting. I put my hands on my cheeks. Despite the wind and ice, they are warm. I realize I am crying. And then something snaps inside of me. Big, horrible sobs wrap rack my chest and my lungs. I tighten my hands into fists around my hair. Alone. I am alone. I wait for Lucas's voice to come, to comfort me and tell me what to do. But instead, there is only silence. His voice is gone. Toby, Toby, get up, I tell myself. I'm speaking out loud in the rain. You can do this without Lucas. No, no, you can't, says the part of me that is small and cold and scared. You can't, you can't, you can't. I'm drowning in my doubt. I can't even get up to save myself. A furry snout burrows between my chin and my heart, and a long, stinky tongue licks my cheek. Hey, Moose, I put out a hand blindly and pat his rain-drenched side. I close my eyes. I can do this, I tell myself. It should have been you instead of Lucas last summer. The awful voice of doubt is relentless. He was the stronger one, the better one. I fold my arms and tuck my hands under my armpits, rocking back and forth. Screw up, the voice whispers. I stare into the hail as it gathers around me. Something twists inside me. I'm not going to accept my bad luck anymore. Screwing up and giving up are two different things. Life is messy, like Denver and his brother's eye, or arsenic in the war, or my parents and their stupid divorce. But all those people kept, keep on going, and I'm going to too. You're worthless, the voice hisses. So what if you kept going? You lost your map. You ran out of food. You couldn't keep Moose from getting skunked. I shake my head, but I found my way again. I'm pointed in the right direction to cut it in. I found food. I'm keeping Moose alive and clean and fed. I'm finally learning to trust myself. I rear back and scream with all of my might. So screw you! I wait for a reply, but there is none. A chunk of hail slips past my hood and trickles down my neck. It is ice cold. Numbness creeps into my fingers and toes. Moose whines and nudges my face. He is shivering. I'm not sure I can save myself, but I'm going to save this scrawny mutt of a dog if it's the last thing I do. I stand up and shake pockets of hail out of my backpack and my coat. It's time to start hiking. Chapter 26. My keeps list to keep warm, hydrated, fed, and mindful of the sun is almost completely shot. But unlike a few days ago when Sean and Denver had to rescue me, I don't panic. I start off at a half jog to warm up. Moose trots doggedly behind, beside me. After a few minutes, I can feel some sensation coming back into my fingers and toes. I jog until I spot a cluster of boulders that make up a little overhang cave, shelter from the lightning and the hail. I urge Moose inside and scooch in beside him. The two of us barely fit, but we are both covered. I open my pack and dig out all my layers, pulling them on as fast as I can. 
The only things I don't put on are two t-shirts. I use one to dry off moose. The other I wrap around his neck like a little scarf. He could use the extra warmth. Then I take out my water bottle, gulping down liquid while tearing into a Snickers bar. Moose gets two cliff bars. We sit and munch and huddle, keeping each other warm while I keep my eye on the weather. The hailstorm finally lets up, giving way to a swathe of thick fog. It is still not great weather, but it'll have to do. I pack up my stuff and make sure the t-shirt around Moose is tight, and together we clamber out of the little cave and back onto the trail. As we hike, I begin to see pieces of sky through the fog. It is a moody gray, but at least it doesn't feel as though the weather is out to get us anymore. An hour later, the fog clears off, and I see two familiar osprey packs in the distance. One is hurrying toward the other. Now that the fog is gone, the trail is easy to spot. Rock cairns as big as barrels line the way, making it fairly impossible to get lost. But the two backpacks are not on the trail. They have veered onto a lone, sharp cliff that plummets into the valley below. Something is wrong. I begin to run. Moose follows behind, his nails clattering against the slippery rocks. By the time I get to them, Denver has slung off his pack and is standing at the edge of the cliff. He is so close to falling that the front of his boots are hanging over nothing but air. Denver, don't do this. It's not your fault, Sean is pleading. Yes, it is, cries Denver. Harry is gone. Everything that he was dreaming of for his life died the second his head hit that coffee table, and I did that to him. Sean shakes his head. It was an accident. You were just horsing around. Denver's right boot jerks forward another inch. I try to tell myself that over and over. I relive that moment in my mind, and all I think of is that maybe, maybe I'm meant to do it. Maybe I'm meant to hurt him. He was Mr. Perfect, always doing the right thing. Denver stares into the valley, his shoulders braced against the rising wind. Do you have any idea what it's like to live in the shadow of your brother? To live with the guilt that you hurt someone you loved and may have meant it? I do, I think. I step forward closer to Sean, then I say it. Denver, I know what it's like. Listen, I killed my best friend. It's the first time I've spoken those words. They cut through me like a newly sharpened blade. I didn't mean to, but I... I can't bring myself to describe the scene. What happened? But I forced myself to keep talking. Because of me, he got into an accident and died. He may not have been my brother, I tell Denver, but he was my best friend. Then the three words that had been battering the inside of my brain for months explode out of my mouth over and over. I killed him. I killed him. I killed him. It was the second to last thing on the list. Despite our fight, we had come so close. Lucas's dad had told us that he would go with us on the trail. Gran gave her consent. We had all the gear, all the maps, everything. We set our start date, August 3rd. We were prepared. And then, on a scorching July afternoon, exactly a week before we were to hit the trail, we set off to tick off number nine, jump off the rope swing at the quarry. The air was sticky hot as we climbed up to the quarry's edge, humidity clinging to our faces like glue. It had been a brutal summer, the hottest on record. When we reached the rope swing, the muddy water below was the lowest I'd ever seen. I, it made the rope swing seem even that much higher. It made me that much more afraid, but Lucas was never afraid of anything. He peered over the side of the quarry and laughed, piece of cake, cake. We'll be swimming around in that nice cool water in no time. And then Lucas said it, seven words that have haunted me every single day. Till, do you want to go first? He had listened to me when I had yelled at him about always being the follower He wanted to give me the chance to change that, to prove that I could be a leader too. In that moment, I wanted more than anything to take charge, to be the one who finished number nine on the list first. But then I took another look down at the water so far below and I couldn't do it. No, I told Lucas, you go first. And so Lucas climbed up the tall red oak with the rope swing slung around its thickest branch and soared off with the grace of an angel, swan diving straight into a block of granite hidden a foot beneath the water's surface. I slid down the steep quarry wall, screaming his name as I pulled him out of the water. But by the time I got to him, he was unconscious. He had broken his neck. He died an hour later in the hospital where we had first met. Sharp explosions of noises snapped me out of my memory. Moose is by my side, giving short, sharp warning barks. His yipping pulls me back into the present, reminding me that I can't lose myself to the past when a friend needs help now. As my eyes refocus, Denver has turned around. He is looking at me. I wait for him to judge me. Instead, he gives me a look of confusion, of not knowing what to think. The whole truth comes spilling out before I can stop it. I wish it would have been me who had died. It should have been me, but it wasn't, and I'm still here. I realize only as I'm saying it that it's true. No matter how guilty and broken I've felt, I haven't given up on Lucas or on myself. 
No matter how unlucky or dumb I am, I've kept going. I made a promise to Lucas that I would hike to Katadin with him, and I'm going to keep my promise. I am shaking but standing taller than I've stood before. You made a mistake too, but as much as you think your brother must hate you, he wouldn't have wanted you to jump off a cliff, and he's still out there. I swallow a lump in my throat. You could still work things out with him. That's not true, Denver says quietly. When he lost his eye, when he found out he would never be able to see if a baseball was an inch or a mile from his head from the rest of his life, he told me he wished I was dead, and then he disappeared. Screw Harry, Sean says. Screw his career and his eye and the guilt he put on you. I know what it's like to live with so much guilt that, that you can barely go on, I say. For a quick second, the past year flashes through my mind, dim and hazy and gray. Taking an axe and destroying the treehouse we had built while screaming bloody murder. Not being able to eat a blueberry or see a worm without breaking down into sobs. Lying in Lucas's backyard for hours, numb with memories and grief. But here's the thing. I take a step closer to Denver. We live through it. We survive. And we learn to forgive ourselves. It is quiet now off the trail. There is, the o- there is only the gray sky, the rocks, the cliffs, and us. My words echo through my head, and for the first time, I wonder if I really can fully forgive myself someday. Denver stands completely still for a moment. His hands are shaking. He takes a step away from the ledge, and that's when a gust of wind hits him like a wrecking ball square in the chest.